This is the Unit 3 AP Macroeconomics Review. So Unit 3 was all about the Federal Reserve money and monetary policy. So that's what we're going to be going into today. This tends to be one of the trickier units because most of us don't really know what the Federal Reserve does on a daily basis because they're not an elected position. They are an unelected position that is nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate to serve a certain period of time as either the chairman of the Fed or on the Board of Governors. And because of that, we don't really vote on the policies that they do. They decided without our say and also without the approval of the government because they're seen as an independent, separate branch from the government so that the people who control the money supply are also not a part of the government directly. So because of that, it can be a little tricky. So we're gonna really go into the tools and how that affects our macro economy. So first off, the Federal Reserve has a complete monopoly control over the money supply. So everything they do in order to try and fix the economy directly relates to increasing or decreasing the money supply. And we see that on the money market graph right here. So this is the graph primarily used for monetary policy because it shows how the Federal Reserve using monetary policy ends up affecting the money supply and therefore interest rates. On this graph, we notice that I have the nominal interest rates on the Y. That's significant. A common AP question is what type of interest rates do banks use? They have to use the nominal. They don't know what inflation is going to be when they give out a loan. So banks use nominal and the banking graph has the nominal interest rate on it. As I said, since the Fed has a complete monopoly control over the money supply, that is the only thing that can move the money supply line. The government can't move it, people can't move it, only the Federal Reserve. So whatever they do directly moves the money supply to the right or to the left. Then we have the money demand line. So if only the Fed can move the money supply, everyone else, consumers, producers, the government, the foreign sector, wait a minute, C, I, G, X, N, nominal GDP moves money demand. So everyone but the Fed. The most common question I've seen on money demand moving is if the government does something, because they're trying to slip you up to see if you'll move the money supply with the government when you're not supposed to. This line can only move directly up or directly down, because the government or consumers, producers of foreign sector cannot change the quantity of money, only the Fed can. So if nominal GDP goes up, money demand will move directly up raising nominal interest rates, but not changing the quantity of money. So for example, if it had you answer the question of how would expansionary fiscal policy affect the money market graph, it would increase money demand, which increases nominal interest rates. But mostly this graph is used to show monetary policy. So that's really what we're gonna be getting into in this unit. And the first thing I wanna go over are the tools of monetary policy. So the Fed has two tools to change the money supply. Open market operations, which are the same as bonds and are the same as government securities. These are a loan from the Federal Reserve to the government. So for example, if the Federal Reserve buys a bond from the government, they are loaning the government money, which when that happens, it's also putting money that didn't exist before into the economy and increasing the money supply which is why buying bonds is a tool of expansionary monetary policy when the Federal Reserve wants to grow the economy out of a recession. If the Federal Reserve wants to shrink the money supply to fight inflation, they'll use contractionary monetary policy. This will shrink the money supply, and with bonds, they'll do this by selling bonds. So if the Fed sells a bond, it's taking the money out of the government's hands that they previously loaned them. And if they take the money out of the government's hands, it's also taking it out of the money supply, shrinking it to fight inflation. The next tool is reserve requirement. Now this tool is not used as often, but it's still one you need to know. They don't really like to mess with the amount banks keep in their vault, but potentially they could change the money supply by raising or lowering the percentage banks have to keep in the vault at all times. So if the Federal Reserve wanted to increase the money supply, they would lower the reserve requirement because then banks could loan out more of their money, putting more money into the economy and growing the money supply. But if the Federal Reserve wants to shrink the money supply, they will raise the reserve requirement 
because then banks have to take money out of circulation, keep it sitting idle in the vault, which would then shrink the money supply. The next tool is also a not very used tool, but since 2008, it has been used because it was used heavily during the financial crisis. So it is one that has popped up more and more. The discount rate is the interest rate on loans from the Federal Reserve to commercial banks. So Fed to bank discount rate. So how this works is if a bank is going under, the Federal Reserve can loan them money. The interest rate on that loan is the discount rate, which then they can also use as a tool of monetary policy. So if the Fed wants to grow the money supply out of a recession, they will lower the discount rate. Because this means banks don't have to pay back as much in interest, and if they don't have to pay back as much in interest, they can loan it out, growing the money supply. Or to fight inflation, the Federal Reserve will raise the discount rate. Because now banks will still get a loan, but have to pay back so much in interest, it takes money out of circulation to give back to the Fed. The next tool is the very commonly used federal funds rate, which is also an interest rate, but a different type of interest rate from the discount rate. The federal funds rate is the interest rate on loans between commercial banks. So how this works, banks keep their excess reserves in their district bank. So in the district bank of Dallas, it has excess reserves from all of the surrounding banks. Other banks can borrow money from those excess reserves. So if Bank of America didn't have enough funds to cover someone's withdrawal of an account, they could borrow money from Wells Fargo's excess reserves at the district bank. So it's the interest rate on those loans. And the Fed sets a target rate, which is directly influenced by growing and shrinking of the money supply. Because when you see this nominal interest rate, that includes the federal funds rate. But how it works in terms of monetary policy is if the Federal Reserve wants to grow the economy, they will set a target low federal funds rate. So again, banks don't have to pay back very much in interest, growing the money supply. Or if they want to shrink the money supply, they'll set a high target federal funds rate. Again, showing that banks have to pay back more in interest and shrinking the money supply. So all four of these tools end up changing the money supply line. And we're going to use expansionary monetary policy to show this. So in a recession, the Fed, as we said, buys bonds and lowers all the reserves and ratios in order to increase the money supply. These would move the money supply line to the right, which would then drive nominal interest rates down. Now what I have in the middle is the investment demand graph. This graph helps you connect the money market graph to the aggregate model graph. And the reason why is nominal interest rates have an indirect relationship to gross private investment, the I of GDP. So if interest rates are lower, gross private investment, the I of GDP goes up. And we just move along the investment demand line to show this inverse relationship. The final connection with that is if investment is a category of GDP, all GDP moves aggregate demand. So if gross private investment goes up, aggregate demand goes up as well which illustrates again how expansionary monetary policy moves the aggregate demand line to the right, contractionary monetary policy would move aggregate demand to the left to fight inflation. When aggregate demand increases, price levels go up, which does mean real wealth goes down. So yes, it does create some inflation and hurts real wealth and real wages, but in a recession, typically price levels are lower, so it's seen as an okay thing to create some necessary inflation and GDP goes up, which drives the unemployment levels down, which is how we fight the recession, by driving GDP up and unemployment down. The other way it would work, contractionary monetary policy, selling bonds, raising the rates and ratios, all four of these things would move the money supply line to the left, driving up nominal interest rates. And that would end up shifting aggregate demand to the left, which is necessary to fight the overinflated economy. With contractionary monetary policy, the downside of that is it does create some unemployment, but just like how it creates some inflation and expansionary, the unemployment created in contractionary is seen as a necessary evil to shrink the economy back to long-run equilibrium where it wants to be. Now you notice I have two notes additionally at the bottom of this, because there are two rules to keep in mind for the AP exam for monetary policy. 
The first rule compares interest rates to the price of bonds. The price of bonds talks about the amount a bond is bought for, amount a bond is sold for. So like a $20 million bond, 20 million would be the price of the bond. Now we don't need to go super into how price bond, prices of bonds work with yield, but you do need to know this rule with interest rates and price of bonds. They have an inverse relationship. So here we see nominal interest rates decreasing. So if an AP question asks you what happens to the price of bonds, you would say because nominal interest rates decrease, the price of bonds increase. So they always have an inverse relationship. The second rule goes into a formula we've talked about many times, the real equals nominal minus inflation formula. What this illustrates on this concept is that when it asks what happens to the real based on the nominal, uh, nominal interest rate you just graphed, they always end up following each other. Because if real equals nominal minus inflation, if you are subtracting inflation, no matter what happens to the nominal interest rate, for example, in this one it decreased, the real interest rate will decrease as well. And you can use that formula as your explanation for why the real follows the nominal. This concludes the Unit 3 AP Microeconomics Review.